I will restore Crazy ancient walls and doors Fill the creatures that they made Your restorer of my way In that day you'll be priest of the Lord In that day I will restore Crazy ancient walls and doors Oh, 
Shalom. I don't know if you read the, the um, email that I sent out it's <laughs> of, the, of the notes. Well, it said in there, I feel another book coming on. And it's been broiling in me for about, I think, right at two months. Two months ago, when I did the teaching that was just mind-blowing, life-changing, amazing, and it dropped an axe in the congregation, and that's when pruning happened, the one about uh, who is Israel, like, like who is Israel, and I, and I, what basically, basically what I did was I, I dropped a sword, same thing Yeshua did, I dropped a sword between Jews and Gentiles so that we could clear the decks and figure out from scripture exactly who is Israel and who is not Israel so that the group that are Jews could say to the group that are Gentiles, come into our thing, come into Israel. Come into Judaism. Come into God's kingdom. Come in, come in, come in. But if you don't divide between Jews and Gentiles, you cannot have that. Because there's nobody to invite anybody in. There's nobody to invite, to invite in because they think they're already in. So when I taught that, and I mean, for me it was mind-blowing blowing because it made super, super clear to me what the gospel is at least the germ of it and I started thinking I need to write a book about what the gospel really is I mean Baptists have taken the ownership of quote the gospel for the last uh, I think about four four hundred years three four hundred years Baptists have taken the ownership of what the gospel is now before that the Catholic Church had ownership of what the gospel is, and that, as you all know, was you know, just way, way out from what the gospel is. But then the Baptists came along, the Protestant part of the church raised up, and the Baptists came along and they said, we are all about one thing and one thing only, the gospel. Here's what the gospel is. And people believed them. And so it spread worldwide so that now, this is my, these are my words, so you can believe it or not believe it. But I would say that probably 98% of people on the planet have not a clue what the gospel is. I certainly didn't. And I've been in America all my life. <clears throat> you didn't. You may think you do, but you didn't. Because you never heard it from a Jew, and you never heard it within the context of Judaism. Okay? Simple. That's just sociology. That's psychology. That's just observation. It's simple. You don't have to be a genius to figure that out, which is why I figured it out. So what I began to see was like it just kept haunting me. Like the gospel is something else. And I kept coming back to Isaiah chapter 40, which says, get yourself on a high mountain, Mevaseret Zion. Zion, gospel bringer. And then right after that it says, get up high, Yerushalayim, Mevaseret Yerushalayim, Jerusalem gospel bringer. That's where the gospel came from. That verse, that's it. Because it doesn't appear before that in the Bible. So that's where the word gospel originated from. So I began looking at this, you know, like, what? Okay, wait, wait a minute. What's the gospel then? Even, you know, 98% of Messianic Jews, you ask everybody what's the gospel, and everybody will say the same thing. Which I'm not going to say because you've heard it a billion times. So I'm going to teach you what, at least part of, what the gospel really is. And it comes directly out of this week's Torah portion. Now, this week's Torah portion is really weird. It's a double Torah portion which only happens twice a year, 
And it only happens in some years. This is one of the years it happens. That we have two Torah portions linked, put together, unified, at the end of the book of uh, Exodus. And remember I've said for the last few weeks that the biggest narrative, the biggest like uh, continuous story in the whole Bible, what's it about? The tabernacle, right, thank you. The tabernacle, so it's been continuous for week after week after week after week. Well, this is, a, this is where it starts winding down. And then after this is Leviticus, which is working in the tabernacle. So the tabernacle is absolutely the most important thing in the whole Bible. The tabernacle and then the temple. The most important thing in the whole Bible. Why do I say that? Because there's more about it than anything else, except one thing. What is it? Mm -hmm. The kingdom. So, <clears throat> there's a whole bunch of twos in this Torah portion. A whole bunch of doubles. I only have some of them, but we're going to look at them, and it's going to naturally lead right into what is the gospel really? What is the gospel really? And I think I have a title for the book called The Gospel of Zion. That's really what it is. Yeah, I mean, like... Like if you were in the first century and you asked Jews, what's the basar? What's the basora is the Hebrew word for gospel. What's the basora? They'd say, the basora tzion. The basora, the meveseret tzion. From that verse in Isaiah 40. Okay, so let's start looking at the Torah portion. The title of the Torah portion is, The Two Congregations is the Gospel. That's what the gospel is. So you've got to pay attention to all the doubles. I've tried to you know, get most of them. I don't have all of them. Exodus 35, 1 through 10 starts with Vayakahel. Say it, Vayakahel. Vayakahel comes from the word kahal, which means congregation. So he congregated. Vayakahel. And he congregated, Moshe, et kol adat b'nei Israel. And that is a weird word to use there, adat. I'm going to prove it to you. It's very, very, very seldom said in the Torah. And not only that, he says it again. A few verses later, he says, Vayomer Moshe el kol adat b'nei Israel, which we'll look at. And Moses assembled or congregated the whole congregation of children of Israel. Now the word congregation here is edut. Or adat. And remember, it means witnesses, witnesses, people who witness each other, that see each other. In 1991, when I went to the top of Masada, there's a big sign there in the front of this ruin, these ruins, and it says, oldest synagogue in the world. I didn't write that sign. The Israel Antiquities Authority wrote that sign, and they put it there. So I trust them. It's the oldest synagogue in the world. So I was there in this space going, this is weird. This is not like anything I've ever seen. Because everybody's facing each other. It's like a square. And everybody's on all four sides of the square looking at each other. This is edut, witnesses. We witness each other. We see each other. We look at each other. All right. Pretty simple. That's why it uses the word adat. Moshe assembled the kol adat of the children of Israel, and he said to them, These are the things Jehovah established to do. Six days work may be done, but on the seventh day you shall have kodesh, holiness, a rest of rests. Shabbat Shabbaton. Shabbat Shabbaton, that means a rest of rests. To Jehovah, whoever does work on it shall die. Do not kindle fire in any of your dwelling places on Shabbat day. Now, First thing he says, which I'll show you, this is the first thing he says when he comes down off the mountain. Do you remember what the last thing he said? The first time he went up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, what the very, very last thing God said was? We'll get back to that. So then he says, and Moshe spoke to Kol Adat Bnei Israel, the whole Adat or congregation of the children of Israel, saying, this is the word Yehovah has established to say. Take from yourself a terumah for Yehovah. Every kind-hearted person shall bring it. 
Jehovah's Terumah. Now, do you remember first time he went up on uh, Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights? Very first thing God said was, take a Terumah. This is the Terumah. The Terumah is, he says it three times, yes? How many times did he say it here? Take for yourselves a terumah for Yehovah. Every kind-hearted person shall bring it. Yehovah's terumah. Gold, silver, copper, blue, purple. How many times did he say terumah here? So there's another double. So now we have double congregation. We have double uh, Shabbat, which I'll show you. We have double terumah. Teach a few Hebrew words here. Gold is zahav. Zahav. Silver is kesef. That's how you say money in Hebrew, kesef, silver. Uh, copper is nachash. What does nachash mean? Anybody remember? Serpent. serpent. Very good. Serpent. means serpent. Because uh, flaming bright. Blue techelet. By the way, you can buy techelet, proper techelet, proper picture techelet, um, seat seat now. If you have, if you don't have this color, oh, I don't even have it. If you don't have this color of techelet, it's not techelet. It may be blue, but it's not techelet. And this is an actual picture to learn from and to teach from. It'll talk to you. But if you don't have the right picture, the right blue, it, it, it won't talk to you the same information. That's why we do it. It's not a law. It's to teach us. But you can buy these now. I've had mine for about a year and two months. A year and three months. So, uh, purple. Purple is argaman. Argaman. Now, there's two words for uh, scarlet or red. It's tolaat sheni. Tolaat sheni. It means the blood of a worm. They crush this certain worm that they get from the trees. And the blood is is the dye that makes the red. Now, also, techelet comes from the blood of a worm. Not a worm, a, uh, a, a shell. Yeah, a snail, shell. From the blood of it. So, how do you make purple? The blood of the shell and the blood of the worm, you put them together and you get argaman, purple. Yeah, squish them. Tola'at shani. And linen, shesh, which means six. And goat hair, ram skins, dyed adamim. Now, this is a different red. This is adamim, like Adam or Edom. It's a different red. Uh, tachash skins, and acacia wood, and oil for lighting, and spices for the anointing oil, and for the incense, and shoham stones, and filling stones for the ephod, for the choshen. And every wise hearted person among you shall come and make all that Yehovah has established. Now, all this shopping list of stuff. This is the terumah. How many times did God say terumah? And he gave the terumah the first time on the mountain. That's two terumahs. He gave it once, now he's giving it again. So terumah shows up twice no matter how you look at it. All right, now here's the second part we're going to look at. This is the second Torah portion. Remember, it's called Piku Dei, which is really hard to translate it. You could translate it, visit, Review, shopping list, appoint, order, um, enumerate, count. Really hard to translate. So they translate it usually count, counting. I put review, but you could put anything. So this is, this is Piku Dei, the beginning of Piku Dei. What it says is, Ele Piku Dei Hamishkan, Mashkan, sorry, Ele piku de ha mishkan mishkan ha edut yeah ha edut asher pukad al pe Moshe. It's hard to say. These are the numbers or enumeration or review or visits or whatever of the mishkan mishkan of the testimony. What doubled there? Mishkan. What doubled there? Okay, so now we have two mishkans. Literally, in the verse, it says, Hamishkan, Mishkan. There's another, another double. So why, why all these doubles? And not only that, there's two Torah portions. Vayakahel and Pikudei. 
So it's, now, by the way, I didn't do the Torah portion this week. I didn't study for it the way I usually do. I usually start on Monday and I start reading Rashi and then I go through and something will jump out. I didn't even do that. This week, I just started writing on the, on the computer. I started the slide. I started writing. Oh, what? And then I would go study that. And then I'd write some more. Oh, what? And I'd go study that. Then I'd write some more. Oh, what? And I start. And this happened over and over and over. And every single time I went, oh, what? It was a double. So I'm telling you, I don't even have all the doubles on here. There's more that you should find. So now we have two Mishkans. And then he says, the Mishkan of testimony which were counted or reviewed or visited by Moshe's mouth. The work of the Levites under the hand of Itamar, ben Aharon, the Kohen, and Betzalel, ben Uri, ben Hur of the tribe of Yehuda, had made all that Yehovah had established to Moshe. With him was Aholiav, ben Hisamach of the tribe of Dan, a craftsman, a master weaver, and an embroiderer in blue, purple, and crimson wool and in linen. All the gold that had been used for the work of the work of the holy, the gold of the waving, that's the terumah. But here it doesn't say terumah. It says tenufa, which is a different word. Why put a different word here? Because he's already said tekufa, I mean terumah, twice. He's already said it twice. So if you put another one, you're going to have the wrong number. So it's tenufa, which means waving. But this is the terumah. All the stuff that was waved was 29 talents, all the gold. 29 talents, 730 shekels. The silver of the congregation numbers was 100 talents and 1,775 shekels. Now remember, number one, this is in the Bible. And believers love to say, the Bible is the word of God. 1,775 shekels. It's in the Bible. It's there for a reason. It's a picture for a reason. Now, I'm not going to go into it because it would take a long time. Just remember that a talent is almost 100 pounds. And they collected almost 100 pounds times 100 of silver. One beka per head. That's a half a shekel. For each one who goes through the counting from 20 years old and upward for 603,550. Now you can see there's lots of detail, details here. I'm not even going to touch them because there's no time. The copper of the waving was 70 talents and 2,400 shekels. That's also a picture. All right, so let's review what happened. Number one, he goes up on the mountain for 40 days starting when? Whoa, what happened? Starting when? When did Moshe go up on the mountain? When? What's it called? Shavuot? Well, come on, guys, please. This is going to take forever. <laughs> Don't do that, <laughs> please. All right, so it's Shavuot, third month, third, uh, third day. They come to Mount Sinai. Three days later, God says, get ready for the third day because I'm going to show up. So nobody has sex. They wash their clothes. They wait for the third day. Then God shows up. And, and all this stuff happens. God gives the ten words. Moshe is down with the camp. And then God says, come up. And he goes up for 40 days and 40 nights, starting at Shavuot. So, Exodus 24, Moshe was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. So, Sivan 6 plus 30 days is Tammuz 6 plus 10 days, Tammuz 16, 17. All right, so they, he's there until Tammuz 16, 17. Then God says, what's that? What's what? I've been with you, enveloped in your glory. So I don't know what's going on. That, your people that you brought up, Moshe, they're whoring around. And Moshe goes, no, 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 no. So he takes the tablet, God gives him the, the, the luchot, the tablets. He goes down the mountain, he climbs down the mountain, and he smashes the tablets, and that's on Tammuz 17. Tammuz 17, he comes down, they kill 3,000 people, they burn the, the golden idol, the Egel Zahav, and then, uh, so now it's another day, Tammuz 18. So on Tammuz 18, 
He's now in the camp, on the ground, and he goes and he prays another 40 days and 40 nights with no food. Deuteronomy 9, I fell down before the Lord 40 days and nights. I didn't eat bread. I didn't drink water. Because of all your sin that you committed in doing what was evil in the sight of Yehovah to provoke him to anger. So now he's been 80 days with no bread and no water. Greatest man who ever lived. So now it's the end of, we got Tammuz uh, 18, plus 30 days is Av 18, plus 10 days is Av 28, 29. So now we're at the end of Av. Very next day will be what? What's the very next day? Elul 1. Thank you for one person paying attention. Thank you. Come on, guys. Elul 1. Elul 1, the month of repentance. So then he goes back. God calls him back up on the mountain for 40 days. Elul 1 to Yom Kippur. And then he comes back down. Exodus 34, 2. Be ready by morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai. So he goes up again. Present yourself to me on top of the mountain. Exodus 34, 28. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He didn't eat bread. He didn't drink water. So now how long has he been without bread and water? 120 days. How many months is that? Three months. Three months, basically, with no bread and no water. Four? Okay. Oh, yeah. She says four. Four months. Four months with no bread, no water. Okay. So those are the three times, three sets of 40 days. On the mountain, on the ground, on the mountain again. Now he comes down. So when he went up the first time, first thing God gave him was the terumah. First thing God said, and God said it three times. Terumah, terumah, terumah. And then he told about it. Then he gave the description of the tabernacle and said, make it exactly, exactly just so as you have seen it in the mountain. Right? That's first thing God said to him. So now we're going to look at this. Moshe assembled the whole congregation of the children of Israel. And Moshe spoke to the whole congregation of the children of Israel. Both times it uses this weird form, which doesn't appear anywhere else in the Torah. And you can check me on it. Exodus 35.1 and Exodus 35.4. It says, et kol adat, the whole edut, the whole adat of Israel, the whole witnesses of Israel. It's a very unusual form because God usually says these four four ways to say it. He says, Diber Moshe et kol Yisrael. The words of Moshe to all Israel. Hadevarim ha'ele et kol Yisrael. These are the words to all Israel. Vaydeber Moshe el b'nei Yisrael. And Moshe said to all the children of Israel. And Diber el b'nei Yisrael. Spoke to the children of Israel. That's what it usually says. And it says it like 90 times. But here, he says edut, or adat, twice. It's two congregations. Now, Jews don't read like Christians read. We're, we're like, like uh, OCD when we read the Bible. <laughs> what? What? What is that? Why did it say that? Oh my God. What did it do? Other people reading are like, ah, da, 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 da. oh, that's so beautiful. But Jews don't read like that. Jews pick it apart. Jews ask questions. Jews go, what? But that's contradictory. That's ridiculous. And then they pick it apart and they find, of course, it's not contradictory. And then they get a teaching from it. They get an understanding from it. Jews reading this go, there's two congregations. Now, this stumped the rabbis. It stumped them. And I got news for you. It stumped them all the way to the first century. And I got further news for you. They're still stumped by it. Because what happened was, some people, some Jewish people, looked at this and went, hey, there's another congregation. It's a secret congregation. It's a sod congregation, which means hidden or mystery. 
It's a mystery congregation. And guess what? They wrote books about it. And guess what happened to those books? No, the, they didn't get banned. But the vast majority of Jews read them and went, bang. What, what, what halakha does that tell me? How does that tell me how to do a law? And so they just kind of dismissed it. But that doesn't mean all Jews dismissed it. There were other Jews who, went into, who, who embraced and loved Kabbalah, the, the secret teachings of the pictures. They loved it. They loved this doctrine of the sod, the congregation. So much so that if you look up the word sod in Hebrew, Guess how it translates it halfway through the description? A congregation. Yeah. Do the research and you'll, you, you can prove that. Halfway through, there's like 10 words that describe sowed. Hidden, secret, mystery, and then it'll say congregation. Because there is a sowed congregation, literally. A hidden mystery congregation. And I'm going to try to show you today, that is the gospel. Shaul said it straight up. He literally said, this is the gospel, the sowed congregation. That's what I'm going to show you. So there's two congregations. Now remember, well you don't remember because I asked you and nobody remembered, but that's okay. The last thing that God said before, on the 17th of Tammuz, before Moshe, before God said, hey Moshe, your, your people that you brought up, look what they're doing. The last, very last thing God told Moshe was Shabbat. Very last thing he said to him. Well now, in our Torah portion, we're reading about the third time that he's up on the mountain. Then he comes down at Yom Kippur. Very first thing he says that God told him. Shabbat. So God picked up where he left off 120 days ago, or sorry, 80 days ago, because the very last thing God said 80 days ago was Shabbat. And now, 80 days later, the very first thing Moshe tells Israel, Shabbat. So I'm going to show you that. So Exodus uh, 31, uh, last thing given on Sivan 6, sorry, on Sivan 6 to 16th of Tammuz, was Shabbat. The Lord spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the sons of Israel, saying, you shall surely observe my Shabbatot. Last thing God said. And then he said, hey, 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 what's going on? What's going on down there? And then he sent him down. When he'd speak, finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moshe the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written by the finger of God, and there went Moshe down the mountain. Then the first thing they gave this time on Elul 1 to Tishri 10 was Shabbat. Six days work may be done. So this is in, in Exodus 35. I was wrong. This is not when he's talking to Israel. This is what God gave Moshe. And then he came down off the mountain and told Israel. But this is the first thing God said in that third set of 30 day, of 40 days. Up on the mountain, 40 days, down on the ground, 40 days, back up on the mountain, 40 days, and that third set of 30 days, very first thing God says in Exodus 35 is six days work may be done, but on the seventh day you shall have holiness. Now, my question is why? Why? Why did God, like, like that's the last thing he said before Moshe went down, why does he have to repeat it on this third set? Why does he repeat the terumah, word for word? What, I'm talking about the whole terumah, the whole shopping list, the whole description of the tabernacle, everything. Why does God repeat that word for word again? Do you think Moshe forgot? No. no. Because there's two of them, yes. Because there's two of them. There's two Shabbats, yes. There's two terumahs. There's two tabernacles. There's two congregations. I mean, think about it. This is the word of God, and God says, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. 120 days later, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Why? Why does he repeat it word for word? It's God's word. What, because we forgot? And repetition is good. We, we need to be reminded. No, 
It's God's word. It's to teach us. It's to show us something. It's to show us that there's one, and then there's another one that looks exactly like it. But it's slightly different. Yes? Yes. Yes. Moshe didn't eat and drink for 120 days, and he lived for 120 years. Yes. And then you taught us that the king is in the field from a little one to Tishri. The king is in the field from a little one to Tishri 10. Yes. Right. And and we get uh, we get judged on Tishri 1, but it gets sealed on the 10. Yes. We're judged on Tishri 1, and it's sealed on Tishri 10. Yes. And that's when he came down. So he gave he gave the word twice, you know, one one to establish one, and then the second time they got sealed. Okay, very good. So he gave it the first time, and the second time it was sealed. Very good. So yes, his life is very definitely a repeating pattern. One, one on top of the other, on top of the other, on top of the other. He repeats the same thing over and over and over again to teach us this stuff. Absolutely. Very good. Okay. Also, it said in our passage that we're reading, you shall have a Shabbat Shabbaton. How many times does God say Sabbath? Twice. Twice. Shabbat Shabbaton. It's two Sabbaths. So there's two Sabbaths too. There's two Sabbaths. There's two tablets of testimony right he shattered the first one so he made a second one there's two tablets there's two congregations yes there's two of everything there's two terumahs tabernacles mishkans two shabbats now previously he said terumah three times yeah back in exodus 25 when god gave it the first time moshe went up on the mountain the first thing god said was Teramah, teramah, teramah. Take three teramahs. And so we know there are three teramahs. But there's not three teramahs. There's two teramahs. In a bigger sense. There were three teramahs that they collected. Yeah? I won't review them. One of them was the silver for the bases. But there are three teramahs. One was all the shopping list to create the tabernacle. And there's two others. But in a bigger sense, there are two Terum, Rom means lifted up. There are two terumas that are lifted up. And they create the tabernacle. So that's why there's two tabernacles. Because there's two terumas to make the tabernacles. You following what I'm saying? Yeah. You may think this is simplistic, but remember what I'm going for. You guys don't know what the gospel is. Don't, don't forget that, that that's the bottom line to this. So don't get lost. You've got to stay with each step. Now this Torah portion, he says terumah two times, telling us there's two terumah. Yes. Yes. It, what's going, what, it's a picture of what's going on in heaven is one, and on earth is the other. Yes. Shabbat that we keep is a Shabbat of the kingdom. The tabernacle that Israel built, is a tab, is a, there's a tabernacle in heaven. Judaism, the way of God, is the shadow that's cast from the same thing in heaven. That's the whole bottom line of Judaism, that it's a shadow cast by heavenly things. Well, the terumah is exactly the same. All right, now what about the terumah? What was the terumah? Gold, silver, Copper, uh, Techelet, Argaman, uh, Tola'at Sheni, uh, gold, silver, copper, um, yeah, copper, purple, blue, all the stuff that they collected, yes? And then all the stuff they made with it. That is the Terumah. Here's the very first thing that's talked about in the Terumah the Ark of the Covenant, yes? Okay, so that's in heaven. There's one in heaven, so he said, make one on earth. And by the way, I don't know if you're aware of this, but in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, it comes right out and says, David collected the gold for everything. That was his terumah. He collected the gold for everything, including the Ark of the Covenant, which is a model 
of the chariot of God. The Keruv, Keruv um, sorry, Merkeva, the Merkeva, the chariot of God. That is the chariot of God. The thing that God rides around on in the Bible, that's it. The Ark of the Covenant is a model of it. So, because there's one in heaven, God said put a model on earth. So I just, I just want you to look at these briefly. There's the one previously, and there's the one in this portion. And I just want to see if you can pick out the differences. They shall construct an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, one and a half cubits wide, one and a half cubits high. They shall overlay with pure gold inside and out. You shall overlay it. You shall make a gold molding around it. You shall cast four gold rings for it. Fasten them on its four feet. Two rings shall be on one side and two rings on the other side. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark with them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be removed from it. You shall put it into the ark of the test. You shall put into the ark the testimony that I shall give you. What's the testimony? The, the two tablets of the, of the ten words, the Torah. They shall not be removed, blah, blah, blah. You shall put into the ark the testimony that I give you. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. All right. Now that was the first one. The second one. Now Betzalel made the... Uh, there's a first difference. Betzalel. There's the first difference. First time. Now remember, this is God's word. This is God's word. The first time in God's word, God says, they shall construct... The second time in God's word, God says, Betzalel made. Now, what does Betzalel mean? Ba? What does Ba mean? In. In. What does Tzel mean? Don't remember? Shadow. What does El mean? God. In the shadow, God. Not in the shadow of God. In the shadow, God. In the shadow is God. Not in the shadow of God. In the shadow is God. What's the shadow? The pictures. Judaism. That's where you see God. So that's why God used this dude. Had him named before, I mean, before he was even born, God said, we're going to call this guy Betzalel. In the shadow. God. Why? Because he's the one who made the shadows. The, the, all the pictures. Betzalel. So Betzalel made the ark of acacia wood, its length two and a half cubits, its width one and a half cubits, height one and a half cubits, and he overlaid it with pure gold inside and out, and made a gold molding for it around. He cast four gold rings for it and on its four feet, even two rings on one side, two rings on the other side. He made poles of acacia. So why does God repeat all this? Almost word for word. Right, because there's two of them. That's the whole point. That's why it's in God's word doubled. Here's the uh, table of showbread. I don't know if you knew that, but that's what the table of showbread looked like. The table of the bread of the faces is what it says in Hebrew. Shulchan, shulchan table, lechem, bread, hapanim, of faces, the faces. Bread of the faces. Why is it called bread of the faces? Look at the bread. They're facing each other. All 12 loaves, and these loaves are huge. All 12 loaves have faces. They face each other. It's one loaf, but the whole loaf on one side is looking at the whole loaf on the other side. That's why it's called the faces. You shall make a table of shittim wood, two cubits long, one cubit wide, one and a half cubits high. You shall overlay it with pure gold and make a gold border around it. Make for it a rim, a handbreadth around. And then in this portion, then he made the table of shittim wood, Two cubits long, a cubit wide, one and a half cubits high. He overlaid it with pure gold and made a gold molding. Don't phase out. Don't disappear now. Because if you do, you're reading like a Gentile. And you're going to miss something. And he made a gold molding for it around. He made a rim of it, a hand breadth all around. He made a gold molding for its rim all around. By the way, as I was reading this, I had to change the illustration. Twice. Because I read it and I was like, oh, no, that's not right. i got to fix that. So I went into the illustration, which started, by the way, with the illustration from the table of the bread of the faces from the Jerusalem Institute in, in Jerusalem. The Temple Institute, sorry, in Jerusalem. 
So I had to change it. And then I started reading some more. I was like, oh my gosh, I missed that too. I got to change it again. Because I paid attention. All right, so this is almost word for word the same. Go down to the end of the first one. You shall make its dishes and its pans and its jars and its bowls with which to pour nesuach, drink offering. You shall make them of pure gold. You shall set the bread of the faces on the table before me. Now, the last part of the second one. This Torah portion. The table. He made the utensils or vessels which were on the table. Its dishes and its pans and its bowls and its jars with which to pour out drink offerings in the suach of pure gold. What's the difference here? It doesn't use the word vessels in the first one. Right? right? It doesn't say the word kelim or vessels in the first one. That's important. But almost word for word he repeats the teruma, the description of the, the table. And the menorah. This I was reading and I, I'm going to say this because this is what I believe. The Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, count the word menorah. I went, okay. So I counted it and I emboldened it for you. How many are there in the first one? Seven. Seven. And I went and I checked it again. How many lamps are there in the menorah? Seven. seven for the seven spirits of God. Chachma, Bina, Etza, Gevora, Da'at, Yerat Yahweh and Yahweh. Sorry, Yehovah. Yerat Yehovah and Yehovah. Seven spirits of God. And look in the second one. How many times is it, is, does it say uh, menorah? Now, why? Because there's one on earth and there's one in heaven. Two teremot. These are exactly the same. That I could find. I think they're exactly the same except for the tense of the verb. Make a menorah, then he made a menorah. This is the Mishkan itself, but I only did the boards here, only the boards. And by the way, the boards were this wide by this thick. It's a tree trunk. Right? Yes, it's huge. You shall make the boards of the Mishkan of Shittim wood standing upright. Anybody know what the boards are a picture of? Us. No. Nope. Not us. Huh? Angels. Good. These are angels. The gold part down there in the illustration, those are the boards. Those are angels standing upright around what? In heaven. Standing around what? God's throne. God's throne. You shall make the boards for the Mishkan of Shittim wood standing upright. Ten cubits shall be the length of each board. One and a half cubits the width of each board. Two tenons for each board. Fitting to each other. And then this portion. Make the boards of the Mishkan. Sorry, he made the boards of the Mishkan of Shittim wood standing upright. Ten cubits was the length of each board. One and a half cubits the width of each board. Two tenons for each board. Lifted, uh, fitted to one another. That's what he did for all the boards of the Mishkan. So, almost word for word, both of them, the same. Why is God so repetitious to teach us that there's two? It's that simple. Now, what about the Choshen? Say Choshen. 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 Now, the Choshen is what they call the breastplate. It's not a breastplate. It's a breastpiece, and it's made out of material. And then there's these little uh, uh, settings, filigree settings, into which the gem is set. And then they're sewed onto this piece of material. By the way, the material, the choshen, is a span like this, this big. But it's not this big. It's twice. Because then it's folded over, making like a pocket. That's like a pocket. Anybody know what was in the pocket? Very good. Urim and Tumim. Lights and perfections. What those are, you can go find out for yourself. We're not going to talk about that. You shall make a choshen of judgment. The work of a skillful workman, like the work of the ephod. Now what I wanted to focus on was, I wanted to find out if the stones and their order is the same in heaven 
as, as it is on earth. That's what I want. That's really all I cared about. Yeah, natural question. That's really all I had time for. But I want you to look at how the second one starts. He made the Choshen, like the work of the Ephod. What's different? The first one in heaven. First one says of Thank you. The first one says of judgment. This one is judgment. This one leaves off that word. Why do you think that is? This one's in heaven, this one's on earth. Why do you think it leaves off the word judgment? No, because judgments take place in heaven. It's that simple, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that one's pretty simple. All right, so let's look at the, the, the order of the, the stones. On the first one, the one in heaven, you shall mount on it four rows of stones. Now, you've got to trust me. I have spent probably close to 100 hours, not this week, but years ago, studying the stones. I know them backwards and forwards. I know what every single stone is, and I know in detail what it is. In my, in my big book, when all the pictures are, are restored, not only do I have the names of the stones in Hebrew and what that means, I have what it is in the minerals, like what the minerals are, modern day minerals. So I have done my research, and you can trust me that I know what I'm talking about in this illustration. And these, this illustration is absolutely accurate. You shall mount on it four rows of stones. The first row, a carnelian, a lot of uh, scriptures translate it ruby. It, it's odem in Hebrew, which means red. But it's different from a ruby. It's different from a ruby red. <clears throat> it's kind of a duller red, a carnelian. A topaz, an emerald. Second one, a turquoise. This is Judah. Judah is not a dark blue. It's this color. Judah is Techelet. I keep lifting up the wrong one. It's this color. It's the Techelet. It's a, it's a greenish blue. It's called chrysoprase in our modern American charts of gems. Pras or pras means blue or green. Nofech in, in Hebrew. So turquoise or chrysoprase a sapphire, and a diamond. Third row, a jacinth. Jacinth is a bright, fiery red or orange. An agate and an amethyst. Fourth row, a barrel. Now, this one's a trip. I don't know if you remember this teaching that I referred to earlier about who is Israel, who is Israel, and who is not Israel. We looked at the tribe of, uh, of Asher. And when there's this long story from the Talmud about a million shekels of oil and a Gentile is sent to go get a million shekels of oil and the Jew gives him even more than that. And why? Because oil was abundant in Asher. What kind of oil? Olive oil. Now this, uh, this uh, uh, barrel is olivine. Olivine is an olive color, kind of like a brownish green um, gem. Olivine. It's called peridot. In, in America, it's the, the month of August. It's, uh, it's what, what was that? Peridot. Peridot. Yeah, peridot, but it, it, I guess some people say peridot. So it's olivine. Now, I did not remember which tribe this was as I was writing this and I went oh I know it's olivine god I wonder if that's Asher and I ran to get my book when all the pictures were restored and I opened up to the chart sure enough it's Asher now I didn't know that when I when I did all this research I knew it was Asher back then but I didn't know about this huge story about there being so much olive oil in Asher that's why it's olivine isn't that awesome Okay, I guess not. Anyway, I loved it. So, olivine, onyx, and yashpe, jasper. They shall be set in gold filigree. Now look at this. The names of the sons of Israel, 12. 
according to their names. They shall be engraved like a seal, each according to the name for the 12 tribes. Doesn't that sound a little weird and repetitious? All right, so let's look at the one on earth. He made the Choshen. No, 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 no. They mounted four rows of stones on the first row. Carnelian, topaz, emerald. Is that the same? Yep. Hello? Yep. Is that the same? Yes. Are you sure? Yep. You positive? Yes. <laughs> Second row. Turquoise or chrysoprase, sapphire, and diamond. Is that the same? Yep. Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. Third row. Jacinth, agate, amethyst. Is that the same? Yes. Huh. Fourth row, olivine or beryl, onyx, and yashpe. Is that the same? Okay. The 12 tribes are the same on earth as they are in heaven. Yeah, you say, of course. Then why don't the Jews match heaven? Or maybe they do. Does the body of Messiah match the Jews? If you look at the body of Messiah, do they look like Israel? Do they talk like Israel, walk like Israel, wear the clothing of Israel, do eat like Israel? Okay, so there's a problem. Heaven on earth is supposed to match heaven in heaven. But it doesn't. Here's where we're going to start looking at the break of what is the gospel. What is the gospel? If the gospel is shown in all this Jew stuff, right? If the gospel is shown in all the Jewish stuff, that's the gospel. How did it become something else? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your whole family shall be saved. That's the gospel. So obviously something happened. Obviously there's a problem. Now look at this down on the bottom. On the bottom. Look on the bottom. <clears throat> According to the names of the sons of Israel, they were twelve. According to their names, engraved like a seal, each with its name for the twelve tribes. Again, weirdly repetitious. Is it the same? Is it the same? The one on the bottom is the one on the top. Is it the same? Yes. Why does it say name three times and 12 twice? Yeah, but why that number? So we're not going to go into the why of the number, but I want you to see that they are the same. And this is God's word. God is not stupid and he's not repetitious. His desire is to communicate. No, let's not go into it. It'll take forever. <laughs> I know you're seeing something, but I, I just can't go into it right now. Okay, now we're going to talk about the big one, and this is the bottom line of the, of, of the teaching. But I think I've laid a pretty good foundation now that you can easily say there's two of everything in all this Jew stuff. Let's keep it real simple. There's two of all the Jew stuff. Would you agree? Yes. Of the congregation, of the terumah, of the things that are built with the terumah, of the Shabbat, everything. Everything Jew is repeated twice. Simple. So there's two Edut, and Moshe assembled the whole congregation at Kol Edut of the children of Israel. And Moshe spoke to the whole congregation at Kol Edut of the children of Israel. And again, weird way to say it, it says Edut, not, not Kahal, which is congregation. Then it says, yes. And it should be the same to the yes, exactly, exactly. There's two witnesses, one in heaven, one on earth, and God says, let everything be confirmed at by at least two witnesses. And so there's, heaven is witnessing earth, earth is witnessing, preaching, telling what they saw about heaven. Yes. There are two adu. Now this is a trip. I read this and I was like, what? What does Rashi say about that? These are the countings of the Mishkan, the Mishkan. 
at the testimony, which recounted by Moshe's mouth. So here's what Rashi says. I never read this before, by the way. Never saw it. Hamishkan, Mishkan. The word Mishkan is written twice. This alludes to the temple. What? What? Where did he get that from? This is, I mean, and he says it like we're supposed to know. This alludes to the temple. Mishkan, Mishkan. There you go. There's the temple. Which was taken as Mashkon. Same word. Mashkon means security or a deposit, a down payment. So he reads it like this. These are all the things about the Mishkan, the down payment of the testimony. And so he says, that's right. And so he says, Shaul talks about that. <clears throat> by, um, it was taken, the Mishkan was taken as security by the two destructions. What are the two destructions? Babylon destroyed the temple and Rome destroyed the temple. The temples were taken as a collateral, a down payment for Israel's sins. Therefore, when Israel fully repents, the temple will be rebuilt. Does that make sense? So he's saying what I'm saying. He's saying there's something mysterious about the future, about there being another temple, another Mishkan. That's about Israel repenting and then them rebuilding the temple. There's something coming. There's something mysterious about this. Now he doesn't get it, but at least he sees that there's something strange here. But there are, like I said, there are Jews who did get it. Here's one of them. There was a book written, not by Enoch, but it was written way, way, way after Enoch in Judaism. I'm sure he, you know, said these words and it was written down, um, but not by Enoch. And it, it was in Judaism. It was all over the, in the first century. It was all over Israel. Very popular book in the, in the first century. First parable, when the congregation of the righteous shall appear. What in the world does that mean? We're already in the congregation of the righteous for the last 3,000 years, aren't we? In the first century. If you're in the first century, and you're, uh, I'm sorry, 2,000 years. You're 2,000 years since Abraham. Aren't you already in the congregation of the righteous, which is Israel? But, yeah, but he says, there's one coming. And so, like, what? What are you talking? We are the congregation of the righteous. No. When it appears, when it finally appears, the sinners will be judged for their sins and shall be driven from the face of the earth. What? There's another congregation of the righteous? Who is that? But he makes it sound like it's not us. Sort of. Well, you're thinking, you're thinking knowing something about the future. This is written as prophecy, not knowing about the future, which I'll show you. Enoch 62, way, way, way later, it says, For from the beginning the Son of Man was hidden, and the Most High preserved him in might, and then revealed him to the elect. And the congregation of the elect, I thought that was us, Israel, and holy shall be sown. Sown means like, like seed, like thrown out, like seed. The congregation of the elect will be sown. The elect will stand before him in that day. What? Now Jews reading this would be very confused by it because they go, wait, that's us. We are the congregation of the righteous. But you're saying there's another one coming. There's somebody else. You get what I'm saying? This is one of the reasons why the word sowed means congregation. Because hidden, it's hidden. And that's the only reason that to some sages was revealed. So to some sages was revealed that there's another congregation that's hidden. Now li listen to me carefully. Listen to me carefully. 
I don't like teaching if it doesn't change your thinking and your heart and give you something to do with it. I think that's a waste of time. You need to learn this because you are surrounded by people who do not, and you're one of them, by the way, who do not know what the gospel is. You do not know what the gospel is because you've never been told. You've never been told. I was never told. None of us were ever told. Because we're not in first century Israel surrounded by Judaism. We're in, in, in whatever century this is. I can't even think of it. In America, surrounded by a, quote, Christian culture that is all based on the gospel. And it's all not Jewish. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. So you need to figure out how to talk about this. You need to figure it out. I can't tell you. I'm figuring out how to talk about it for me, but you've got to figure out how to talk about it for you. And what you cannot do, what you cannot do once you've heard this, is like a spring, spring right back to the way you were thinking and talking. You can't. Because if you do that, you are then going to be held responsible for having been, it says in the Talmud, shown delicious foods and having not eaten them. That's what it says in the Talmud. And it's talking about getting good Jewish stuff and not devouring it, not eating it. And you're going to be held responsible for it. So I just want to caution you before we go into this too deeply that don't don't veg out on me. Don't, don't phase out because you think you know what I'm saying. You do not know what I'm saying. And I'm going to try to help you to be able to talk about this in a rational way. Okay, so this passage in Numbers is the only passage that the Jewish sages and rabbis used to talk about this hidden congregation. And it's about these two guys, Eldad and Medad. They're both Jews. And what it says is, two men had remained in the camp. Now what happened was Moshe said, go get all the leaders and bring them, outside, bring them out of the camp so we can like set them apart. And the Holy Spirit, I'm going to put some of my spirit on them. And they'll be filled with the spirit and they will start prophesying. But two guys stayed in the camp, Eldad and Medad. They didn't do what they were supposed to do. So they don't belong. They're in the wrong place. Two men had remained in the camp, Eldad and Medad, and the spirit rested on them too. Now these were among those who had been recorded to go out, out but had not gone out to the tent where God was going to be. But they prophesied in the camp. They weren't supposed to do that. Then Yehoshua said, Moshe, shut them up. Shut these guys up. They're doing it wrong. And Moshe says, I wish all the Lord's people, all the Jews, were Nevi'im, were prophets. That the Lord would put his spirit on them or in them. Now, it says that in the New Testament. I wish all the Lord's people were prophets. Shaul says it. He quotes this. Now, you can find an normative Jewish source, and I've got it here for you. It's called The Twelve Prophets by Sonsino Press. And it says this, the scripture is, And it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. And on the male and female servants I will pour out my spirit in those days from Joel 2. Messianic Jews love this verse. They love this verse and that's where they stop. This is just the beginning. Because what the rabbi says about this in the commentary, after this, the word acharimi, acharit, afterward, in the Messianic age, after this, in the Messianic age, everybody will be filled with the Spirit. The prophet now declares that the Holy Spirit of prophecy also will be bestowed on young and old in the future. It will be the possession of everybody, as Moshe expressed. Now, when a Jew says everybody, 
this is what freaks everybody out in Judaism. He means Gentiles, too. The rabbi here means Gentiles. And the commentary goes on to argue about it. Everybody, including Gentiles? Yes, everybody, including Gentiles. What? And here's where the break comes. Now, Christians, Gentiles go, well, of course. But Jews do not, because it was hidden. It was a secret. And you need to change the way you're thinking if you go, well, of course. It's not of course. Gentiles were not allowed in unless they said, I want to come in and do what you're doing. Yeah? Okay. Now, this was understood by a few people in the, in, in the first century, but not many. This is why we read in Acts chapter 15, in verse 1, it says, Jews came down from Judah and said, What do we do with the Gentiles who are believing in Yeshua? Circumcise them and instruct them to keep the Torah. Yeah, cool. So we've always done. And then Peter says, I don't think that's right. I don't think. And they start arguing about it. And then Paul and Barnabas go, no, that is not right. We've been out there giving the gospel, the gospel, the gospel to the Gentiles. And so they were like, but you're not having them circumcised and converting? Nope. And they're getting the Holy Spirit as it says in Joel? Yep. Okay, let's all go up to Jerusalem and talk this out with the heads of the Messianic Jews. Okay, let's do it. So they all go up. They have a big debate, big argument. Peter says, look, I was the first one that God said, go talk to Gentiles. And God, they believed in Yeshua, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, just like we were. And God showed me, don't make a distinction between the Jews and the Gentiles. But they still didn't know what to do with them. What do you do with them? Because Peter was going, okay, come do Judaism. I guess. But Paul and Barnabas said, no, no, there's so much more to it than that. And they said, we're giving them the besorah, the gospel. And so they talk about it. And then Jacob, wisely, He's the head of all the congregations, and he says in Acts 15, Therefore it is my judgment that we don't cause trouble for those from the Gentiles. What does he call them? Gentiles. Why? Because that's what they are. Now, I mean, this is the simplest thing in the world, which I'll show you more and more and more and more of. But people won't say they're a Gentile. If they're in Messianic Judaism, it's craziness. But he says, he calls them Gentiles, and he's the head of all the Messianic Jews. And he says, the people who are turning to God who are Gentiles, who are Gentiles, who are turning to God, but that we write to them, they abstain from food contaminated by idols, from sexual immorality, from strangled animals, and from eating blood. Why? Because from ancient generations, Moshe has those who preach him in every city, and he's read in synagogue every Shabbat. So, yeah, Judaize them. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. Believe in Yeshua, and then start reading, hearing, studying, doing Moses. That's the gospel. Okay. Now, Paul was the one who really understood this. And we're going to look at what he said. And I want you to look for two things. Number one, I want you to look for this. Did he call the Gentiles who already believed in Yeshua Gentiles? Yes. That's number one. Because if he doesn't, if he says, you were formerly Gentiles, but now you're whatever. That's different. But if he calls them Gentiles after they're believing in Yeshua and going to the synagogue learning Moshe every week, this is a whole new thing. And then the second thing I want you to look for is the hidden congregation, the second congregation. 
Ephesians 2. Remember that formerly, you, it doesn't say you were formerly Gentiles. It says that formerly you, Gentiles in the flesh. So what does he call them currently? Gentiles in the flesh. He calls them Gentiles in the flesh. Yeah? yeah? But formerly, you Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, remember that you were separate from number one, Messiah. Remember you were separate from Messiah. Remember. Not that you were raised in America in a Christian society thinking you've been Christian all your life. Remember that you were formerly cut off from number one, the Messiah. You were excluded from number two, the commonwealth. What's commonwealth? That's the word edut. Or it could be kahal, congregation. Edut or kahal. There's no such thing as commonwealth in Hebrew. But a thousand times in the Torah, it does say edut and kahal. So that's what he's got to be talking about, yeah? Because that's all there is in the Torah. So you were separate. You were separate from the edut, the kahal of Israel. And you were, now why is Paul talking to these poor Gentiles like this? That's the gospel. Do you think he said something different? When he was with them, oh, you've come now to Christ. But that's what people picture. They think that in his letters, he's reflecting how he was, which was so nice to the Gentiles, and we don't want to deal with those Jews. But the truth is, these are rough words. Wouldn't you agree? You were cut off. You were separate. You weren't part of. Don't forget. You had, you had nothing. Right, honey. Right? That's rough words. This is how he spoke. This is how he taught the gospel. Gentile, you are cut off from God. You're cut off from Israel, the Edut of Israel. You're cut off from the covenants of promise. You're cut off from the Messiah. And look at number four. I think this is mean. You had no hope. When was the last time you said that to a Gentile, a Christian? Somebody who calls themselves a Christian, and you don't even know if they're born again. You don't even know. You're not sure. When was the last time somebody said that to you? Or you said that to somebody? You had no hope. You're cut off from the Jews. You're cut off from Israel. You're cut off from God. You're cut off from Messiah. Why? Because you're a Gentile in the flesh. You're a Gentile. These are rough words. Cut off from number five, God. This is the gospel. But now, in Messiah Yeshua, don't phase out here. It doesn't say you were brought to the throne room of grace. It doesn't say you were brought to God. It doesn't say, well, it does say that. It doesn't say you were brought to heaven. It doesn't say you were brought to the grace or anything like that. What it says is, you who were formerly far off. Far off from what? Those five things that he just listed. Have been brought near to what? To those five things. By the blood of Messiah. This is the gospel. I want to show you more. This is the gospel. The gospel is that Gentiles who are far off, like Abraham, are brought to the Torah. Because it says Abraham did the mitzvot, the commandments, the Torah, the instructions, the mishmarim, the watches, or the, um, the cycle of the festivals, new moon. I'm sorry, yeah, cycles of the festivals, the new moon, the Shabbat. And the Chokim, statutes, that's Judaism. And he brought Abraham to it, right? And then in the redemption, when the Jewish people were redeemed from Egypt, they were redeemed from Egypt to go to what? To, to Mount Sinai, where God gave Christ? 
Torah. And so that's always been the pattern. God takes the Gentile, the people that are cut off and separated, and he brings them toward the Torah so they can get to know God. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. You were brought near but to those things by the blood of Messiah because he made both the Gentile and the Jew into one. Into one how to live. For from ancient generations, Moshe has those who preach him in the city, in every city, since he's read in synagogue every Shabbat. That's how you live. That's the gospel. Now look at these. This is in Ephesians and Galatians. What I, here's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping you now read these differently. That's what I'm hoping. I'm doing my best to try to change the way you read these and see these and understand them. I'm doing my best. When you read, you, now look at this. Look what Shaul says here. When He's talking to Gentiles. Gentiles. When you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery. When you read what? I guess he's talking about his letter. And maybe the Torah, too. When you read, you can understand my... This is Shaul talking. He says, my insight. When you read, you can understand my insight. That's pretty big, don't you think? It's in the Word of God that Shaul says, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery, the sod of Messiah, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, like it has been now revealed by his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit to be specific. Guess what he says? Gentiles. That's pretty clear, right? To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body. What's the body? Israel. Remember when Israel came to Mount Sinai? It said four times they came, they encamped, they rested, they were there. And then it flips and it says he encamped at Mount Sinai. One guy, one body. And the, Je the Jews, they didn't know what to do with the Gentiles who were getting born again. But Shaul did, and here it is. I mean, think about these words, man. He says, in the word of God, preserve for us in the word of God. When you read, you can understand my insight, which is that the Gentiles are fellow members of that body of Israel. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. And fellow partakers of the promise of Messiah Yeshua. These are huge words. Do you get what I'm saying? Now think about conversations you've had about people with people about the gospel. And you went, I know, isn't it great? Yeah, man. The Ruach HaKodesh is doing this and doing that. And yeah, yeah. And you agreed with them and you went along with it because you were like, yeah, that sounds good. But it's not good. It's not true. Because the bottom line, the end goal of that conversation, I'm just guessing, was probably not this. That Gentiles got to do Judaism. To come to know God. You get what I'm saying? This is heavy. It's amazing. Ephesians 4. So I say this and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer as Gentiles walk. He's talking to Gentiles and he tells them, stop walking like Gentiles. So then what are they supposed to walk like? Jews. Yeah, Jews. Halakha, holech, to walk. Halakha, that's the quote laws of Judaism, how you do stuff. And he tells Gentiles, don't walk like Gentiles. Why? Because you're now part of Israel. That's the gospel. In the futility of their... Uh, look, at, look at these words. Look at these words. Don't walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, number one, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of ignorance that's in them, because of the hardness of their heart, because they, begot, they got callous 
and gave themselves over to the sensu sensuality. Seven things he slams Gentiles with. And I can't say a word against Christians. If Shaul was here, you would get, you'd spit on him and get up and walk out. Actually, you wouldn't spit on him because then you'd look bad. It's not Christian, right? <laughs> but you certainly wouldn't like what he's saying. You wouldn't like it. Unless you're thinking to yourself, yeah, but I'm already in. I'm already in, so it doesn't bother me. It should bother you. Because you may be in, but you may not know how to, your way around in it. You don't know how to worship like a Jew. You don't know how to sing and praise like a Jew. You don't know how to make noise. You don't know when it's time to stand, when it's time to walk, when it's time to fall down, when it's time to close your eyes, when it's time to rise, when it's time to get off your phone. You don't know how. Because you don't have Jews going, that's wrong. And then you go, okay, wh wh how, wh how should I do it? Thank you. Instead of, really, you're going to talk to me like that? Which I get every week. In a tiny congregation like this, I get that every week. So something's wrong. Something's wrong. I mean, this is, these are mean, mean, mean words that Shaul is saying. But the big one is this. Don't walk like a Gentile. So then how are you supposed to walk? Galatians 2. Verse 2, verse 8, and then verse 14 through 15. The gospel that I preach among the Gentiles, or he, <laughs> the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles, or he who effectually worked for Peter in apostleship to the circumcised, effectually worked for me also to the, what does he call them? Oh, is he mean? Why does he keep calling them Gentiles? That's what they are. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. So he's going to immediately talk about the thing you don't want to hear about. Relationship between Jews and Gentiles. That's the gospel. Relationship between Jews and Gentiles. Israel and Christians? Maybe. That's the gospel. It's all about the relationship between Gentiles and Jews. That's the bottom line. And he says, you know, when these guys came from, from, from Peter, I saw they weren't straightforward about the gospel, the truth of the gospel. So I said to Kepha in the presence of everybody, if you, being a Jew, Peter, Kepha, live like the Gentiles. He's saying this to Peter. Peter lived like the Gentiles? I mean, I thought Peter was like the big one, the heavyweight, the one everybody loves because he was, he was such a close follower of Yeshua. But Shaul rebukes him and says, but look what he says. Look at the specifics of how he rebukes him. He says, if you, being a Jew, Kepha, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how can you possibly compel Gentiles to live like Jews. He can't Judaize them because he's living like they are. In some ways, he's being a hypocrite. And by the way, he uses the word hypocrite here. He says, I rebuked him for their hypocrisy. He uses the word hypocrite because the Jews were getting sucked into living like the Gentiles, instead of the Jew, Judaizing, greatest word in the English language, Judaizing the Gentiles. That's the gospel. Judaizing the Gentiles is the gospel. That is the gospel. And he says, dude, you can't do it. I'm going to read this again. If you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how can you compel? Now, the way it reads is like, how dost thou compel the Gentiles? It's not that. It's like, how can you do it? How are you going to do it? You can't. How can you possibly compel the Gentiles to live like Jews, which you are supposed to do? 
Because he said, don't live like Gentiles. Got to live like something else. We, now look at it. nobody ever quotes this. We are Jews by nature, Kepha, and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nobody likes that verse that I've ever shown it to. Nobody. They immediately change the subject. We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. And yet, when these Gentiles come in, what does Shaul call them? Gentiles. Gentiles. He doesn't stop calling them Gentiles. Yes. Kepha is, uh, Kepha is the Hebrew for Peter. No, no, it's just like, it's just like uh, Paul and Saul. By the way, I don't know if you know this, but almost every single Bible character has at least two names. Did you know that? Almost every single, and probably every character, but I haven't been able to verify that. But I've got it down to about 80% of biblical characters have two names. Well, he's one of them. Now, Galatians 3. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles. Again, he calls them Gentiles. Preach the gospel. Oh, here we go. The scripture preached the gospel. That's what it says. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles, preached the gospel to Abraham. How did the scripture, there was no scripture when Abraham was alive. Through the Holy Spirit, right? That's why Abraham did Judaism. Remember? Nachma, uh, sorry. Yeah, Nachmanides said, how did Abraham do Judaism, do the Torah, the whole Torah? By the Ruach HaKodesh. Remember? Okay. Scripture preached the gospel to Abraham. What did Abraham do? Judaism. Judaism. And that's how it preached the gospel, the Basora, to Abraham. And here's the words that he said, all the nations, all the Gentiles will be blessed in you. So if there's no Jews, Israel, distinct from the nations, how are the Jews, Israel, the children of Abraham, going to bless the Gentiles? Because there ain't no Gentiles. We're all one. You see? You must understand that there's a difference, a huge difference, huge difference between Israel and the Gentiles. And you're invited into that complete upside down, backwards, inside out world that you know nothing about. But you gotta look at it like that or else you're never gonna know what the gospel is. And you won't know what Abraham knew. So then, those who are of the faith, uh, who, those who are of understanding, of faith, are blessed with Abraham the believer. Remember, Abraham did the Mishpatim, the Mitzvot, the Chokim, and the Torah. And that's how Scripture preached the gospel. A Gentile doing Judaism. That's the gospel. You starting to see what I'm saying? I'm, I'm hoping your mind, it's like a ship, and it takes a long time to turn that ship. Romans 9. And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us, whom he also called, not from among Jews only, us, those who were call, called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. He calls them Gentiles. As he says, now look at this, as he says also in Hoshea, I will call those who are not my people, the Gentiles, my people. But that doesn't mean you stop calling them Gentiles. 
and her who was not beloved, beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, you're not my people. There they will be called sons of the living God. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. It's not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you and your house shall be saved. It's that you as a Gentile get to come into a Jewish body, do Judaism, and therefore come to know God. That's the gospel. If you had to bring it down to one tiny little statement. Romans 11. Salvation has come to the what? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Why doesn't he say to former Gentiles? Because they're Gentiles. Salvation has come to Gentiles to make the Jews jealous. That's why God saved you if you're a Gentile. It's for Israel. It's not for you. Well, it is for you, of course. But it's not for you. Ultimately, it's for Israel. To make them jealous. But you're not living like a Jew, so how are you going to make them jealous? I guarantee it's not going to happen. Only thing that made me jealous to bring me to the Messiah, really bring me to the Messiah, was Joe Good, a Gentile who taught me Judaism. And I was so jealous I couldn't eat, drink, sleep, couldn't concentrate for a month because I was jealous. And that brought me into, into Israel, into God's body. Salvation has come to the Gentiles to make the Jews jealous. Now, if their transgression, if the Jews' transgression is riches for the world, and their failure is riches for the, he calls them Gentiles again. This guy won't get off it. How much more will there the Jews' fulfillment be? But I'm speaking to you who are former Gentiles. No. I'm talking to you believers who are Gentiles. He cannot be any clearer. He can't be any clearer. They're Gentiles. And he's talking to them and calling them Gentiles and saying, this is what you're in, man. This is what you're called to. Open your eyes and look what's going on. And this was before the church took over the universe and destroyed Judaism and spread throughout the earth the doctrine, the heresy of Hellenism. This is before that. And he calls them Gentiles. And right after this, he talks about being grafted in. Because that's the gospel. Gentiles, you are grafted into what? Judaism. Judaism Israel. All right. Hopefully, I have gotten it across that this is what the gospel is. This is the secret congregation. This one is probably the clearest passage where he comes right out and says it. But there is a hidden secret congregation, and that is the gospel. That's why the Jews don't know what it is, because they don't know what the gospel is. They didn't know what to do, to do with Gentiles. Even It says it in Acts 15.1. They came down from Judah and had no clue what to do with Gentiles who were coming to the Jewish Messiah. Romans 15, 9 through 12. For I say that Messiah has become a servant to the Jews? Really? Did you ever see that before? That Messiah became a servant to the Jews. Now, why? So that they could get born again? He doesn't say that. He doesn't say that. No. The Gentiles are to make the Jews jealous. This said that Messiah became a servant to the Jews, not to the Gentiles. So what, where, what could that mean? Where could that go? Messiah has become a servant to the Jews on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers and for Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy. Messiah became a servant to the Jewish people to confirm all the stuff God said to Israel and to bring Gentiles in. 
And so he says, and that's why it's written in Psalm, uh, 2 Samuel 22:50 and Psalm 18. So I will give praise to you among the goyim, the Gentiles. You ever see that before? We sang it. I will give praise to you. This is David writing. Why would David say that? David says, I, I, David, King David, will give praise to you among the Gentiles. I will worship as a Jew among the Gentiles. I was telling the pastor here this last week, Jews used to be really evangelical in the first century and before. Did you know that? Jews were incredibly evangelical. Now, you'll read the words of Yeshua and you won't recognize it. He says, you'll travel heaven and earth to what you hear is and make them twice the, twice the sons of hell as you are. And remember, he's talking, these are brothers talking to each other. And he says, you'll travel heaven and earth to go get one convert, a Gentile, just to make him twice the son of hell as you are, to stick him in the curse of the law. They were very, very evangelical. Jews were spread out to the whole earth as shlachim, apostles, to go reach Gentiles. And yet Yeshua said, do not go to the Gentiles. Go only to who? Yeah. The lost sheep of what? The house of Israel. Go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and tell them what? The Basara, the gospel. Judaism. Do Judaism to get to know God. Mm -hmm. Come back to Judaism. Judaize them. So then he says, so I will, David says, I will give praise to you among the Goyim, and I'll sing to your name. He didn't say I'll give praise to you in the great congregation of Israel. He says, I'll give praise to you among the Goyim. What are Goyim doing there? They came in. Come on in. Come on in. They came in. They came to the temple. There was no temple. They came to the Mishkan, the tabernacle. And they worshiped God, and they got to know God. And then he says again, and, Deut and by the way, who would mix these passages together? 2 Samuel 22 and Psalm 18. And he mixes them together like it's breathing. And then he brings up Deuteronomy 32 and says, hey, here's another one. Rejoice, O Goyim, with his people. What does that mean? The Goyim came to his people, the Jews, right? And then he says another one. In Psalm 117, praise the Lord, all goyim. How are they going to do that? Come to Israel. Come on. And let all the peoples, that's all the Gentiles, praise him. And again, Isaiah chapter 11, he quotes that. There shall come a root of Jesse, and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles, which, by the way, it does not say in Isaiah 11. It does not say to rule over the Gentiles. It says in a real roundabout way, he'll have the scepter of David, and it gets real complicated. But the bottom line is, he's going to rule over the Gentiles. That's what it says in a roundabout way. To rule over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles hope. And remember, Shaul said, that's one of the things that the Gentiles don't have. What number was that? What number was it? Hope. Four. That's the fourth thing out of five that he says Gentiles do not have until they come to Israel through Yeshua. Get it? To rule over the Gentiles. In him, the Gentiles will hope. All right. So I think, well, I've done as best I can. I think I've made it pretty clear. Number one, people don't know what the gospel is. Number one. Number two, I mean, don't say it. Maybe you can disagree with me. You don't know what the gospel is because you've never been told. Number three, you've now been told what the gospel is. And number four, you need to go make this sure inside of yourself so that you can talk about it. Because you know what you're supposed to be doing? Judaizing. 
You're supposed to be Judaizing. Even you Gentiles, you're supposed to be Judaizing. You've been brought into the Jewish thing. This is your house. You better talk about your house. Right? Okay. Let's pray. Abba, thank you that you have made so clear that there's a hidden congregation, another congregation. I ask, Father, that you would open the eyes of many, many teachers to see what the gospel really is, to see the gospel of Zion. Mevaseret. Zion, Zion, the gospel bringer. And Lord, I ask that you would anoint these words, that you would bring many people to listen to these words. In the name of Yeshua, Father, by your spirit, I ask that you pour out your spirit and pour out your Torah and blend them together in your body in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Let's stand for the Aleinu. Just the first part, just the first part, first paragraph. Aleinu l'shabeach la'adon ha'kol, l'tet gedula l'yotzer bereshit, shelo asanu kagoye ha'aratzot, v'lo hosamanu k'mishpachot ha'adama. Shelo sam kelkenu kahem, vegoraleinu kekol hamonam. Let us adore the Lord of all, who in greatness created the world from of old, that he has not made us like the nations of the earth, not made us like the families of the land. He has not made our destiny like theirs, or cast our lot with all of them. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Let's do Kiddush, please.